You may be seated. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I had a lot of friends here today. Thank you for all our friends visiting with us. I name you by name, but I don't want to do that and stand up and all that type of stuff. But it's great having many old friends here with us today. Um, next week we're going to get in. We're, this is continuing the series, Overcoming Life's Barriers. Um, next week we're going to talk about it. And this, I'm saying, promoting next week because I don't really like what I'm saying this week. Or anything like that. <laughs> like that. No, I'm, I'm, I'm promoting next week because I think um, um, we're going to talk about anger and wrath. Two subjects I don't talk a lot about. And you'll see some of the things and the difference between anger and wrath, biblically speaking. There's two Greek words, there's thumos and orge, and they def have different applications and different meanings and that you know, we can apply to our life right here, right now, in our families, in our marriages, in our walks with God. It all happens right real time with us. But I say that now because we're going to dovetail. What we're saying this morning is going to lead us right in to next week's um, message that we're planning. And I'm pretty, again, the whole series, I, um, I think you'll find helpful. The Christian walk, our life, um, being indwelt by the Holy Spirit and really being transformed into spiritual transformation. Let's just back up a minute. God's ideal for my life is not my happiness. It's not my economic blessing. Um, it's not a healthy body. Those things all may happen. There's nothing wrong with those things. God's ideal for my life is to be like Jesus, to become Christ-like. And he allows things in our life to make us Christ-like, whatever that is. And it's going to be different for um, all of us. I know in my life, I don't learn well with suffering. <laughs> In my life, God just lavishes me with blessings all the time. And, and I win the lottery every time I pray for it and, 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 and stuff like that. And, and I just don't need to be suffering. I remember praying with my wife years ago, God, we want to learn everything that you want to teach us about life and you. We just don't want to, any pain. <laughs> And he said, Tim, that would be pretty much impossible um, to teach you anything without pain because you were born with a very thick skull, <laughs> and I need to work through it. So understanding that's our ideal. So how do we get transformed? How do we allow God, and it's God's responsibility, Philippians 1.6, to bring us into spiritual transformation, spiritual uh, maturity, Christ's likeness, when we reflect Christ in our lives, Christ's heart, Christ's love, Christ's patience. We reflect them. Now, last week, we defined a wall or a barrier as this. It's a place of wound, weakness, or resistance that hinder, hinders, and I should say, or mutes our spiritual transformation. Now, I said what I just said because I'm assuming that our spiritual transformation is what we all want. That's what we want, our spiritual transformation. I want to be Christ-like in my relationships with people. I want to be Christ-like in my thought life. I want to be Christ-like in my marriage. That's a very difficult one sometimes. I, can be, I want to be Christ-like with my children. That's my goal, is to be Christ-like. And I'm not talking about WWJD, what would Jesus do? That's just copying. I'm talking about something that happens in here that whittles away the old me and conforms me, Romans 8, 29, into the image of Christ. Now, most of these walls are created by all sorts of different things. Trauma, to some degree. Trauma is an old, just a word that means woundedness. Things that happen in our childhood wounds us. The betrayal of parents in one manner or one form or another, however that may be, through ne neglect, abuse. Um, how we live, living environment, level or type of parental care. As you know, we're opening up the Hannah Grace Homes, and we have uh, two, two locations. I know in the Florida location, I asked the state of Florida, um, what type of girls will we be getting? And, and that's kind of an idea of who will be coming into our facility there. And they said, you'll get mostly be getting older kids. And I said, what will be the level of sexual and physical abuse on these young ladies? And they said, 100%. 
I, and I was shocked, 100% yes. If you're getting them, is they've already been through it. So they carry these barriers into their lives. They can't trust adults because what have adults done to them? Why should they trust God? It's a barrier. Barriers are protective. We build them around ourselves to keep us from pain or having to deal with past pain. I was in a counseling session once numerous years ago with something with a, somebody with a condition called disassociation. It's interesting. Um, mental condition. Very normal person, educated person, very sweet and kind person. But because of their abuse as a young child, when the abuse was happening, they would click off into another personality and pretend like it wasn't happening to them so they wouldn't experience the pain and, and everything that was actually happening to them in the physical realm. And that is, it sounds like schizophrenia, but it's not. They're very aware of this other individual in their lives. They have a name and a relationship with them. I talked to the other individual in a counseling session. I didn't do a really good job with her. <laughs> sort of freaked me out a little bit. All of a sudden, you talk to some person, and another person shows up in the same body. But that's how they compensated. That was a protective barrier. This other personality that their little mind, when the abuse was happening, created, that's a rare exception. That's not that common. But it backs up the point I'm saying these walls are protective. They're there for a reason. But they also keep us from freedom on the inside. And they keep us from healthy relationships. They keep us from experiencing the promises of God. And they keep us from experiencing the liberty of walking in a spirit with a spirit-filled life. The verses we launched with, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and destroy false arguments. Paul was speaking specifically here about people arguing against his um, the theology and his apostleship. And they were coming and confusing the church at, at Corinth. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture the rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. And your King James, or another translation, I think does a very good job with this. They may say, you bring every thought into captivity. What an exhortation that is. I bring every thought into captivity. Then what do I do when I capture it? Just keep it in a cage? No, I have to take that thought and filter it. And get the impurities and get the error out of it and get the woundedness out of it the best I can and apply it to the sieve of the Word of God which is pure and living and quick and powerful. So a couple barriers, I call them modern day barriers in my notes because I don't think these are barriers that really challenged us that much a, a thousand years ago or a five hundred years ago. I don't think these barriers challenged a lot of people outside of America maybe in the Western world, but certainly not in the third world. But here's a barrier. It's called the I deserve it barrier. <laughs> you don't think about this much, but this is when we, arrogant, we, we uh, arrogantly think we're entitled to something or that we are owed something. It invades people's lives. I've watched it cause Christians to start running down rabbit trails, this little level of arrogance comes in and says, how come this person has something and I don't have something? How come this person seems blessed and I didn't seem blessed? How come this person has a spouse and I don't have a spouse? How come I'm wearing the white hat, but the guy with the black hat always seems to win? Why does that work like that? Here's the famous words. We may never utter them. It's not fair. <laughs> you never heard those words from your kids, have you? You never heard that. This is a disease that can creep into our ministries. When it becomes about me and not really what we're trying to minister to. 
I deserve this. People bind up the local church in the sense that it becomes about their place in the church and not the ministry of the church. We're not here to stake our claim in some role or job that we do here. We're here to reveal Christ and Christ's likeness to people that live across the street that are never going to walk in our doors. And we're not going to do that if we're here fighting with one another as you stepped on my piece of turf. That's my job. That's my seat. I've told plenty of stories through the years. I had an usher throw somebody out of their seat because a visitor at that. We had that usher killed. <laughs> He's buried back there somewhere. I'm kidding about that. We didn't really have him killed. Um, God killed him a, f a few years later, but it was, um, but it was, it was I told him, God, take care of that guy. He just threw a visitor. It looked actually nice and, and out of our church. We had a greeter years ago. Some of you remember little Dottie. She's home with Jesus now, and she was 89 years old, and, and we had four doors our church back then. If you don't know, our church has to be moved so many times. It's, I've lost they don't, the address. They just send it to a P.O. box now. We just, What's our address this week? And, and, um, and they... Um, and good old Dottie, she was 89. We decided we wanted to have a little bit more of a cross-generational view to our church. So we put some teenagers out there with programs. We put some elderly out there with programs. But Dottie would have nothing of it. This was her job. And these little punks weren't going to come in and inter interfere with her job. So Dottie, who weighed about 80... And, um, but really spry, and she would go to this door, hand a bulletin out to this door, literally run to the next door in front of the teenagers. The poor teenagers are there and they're afraid that Dottie was going to take them out. And this just went on week after week after week. I said, Dottie, let somebody else hand a bulletin out. Let somebody else greet. This is my job. <laughs> yeah, and we're doing it under Jesus, right? See, this is the spirit of entitlement. I have a pastor friend of mine, well, not an acquaintance, I should say, at this particular time. This goes back a decade plus. He had 20 people in his church or so, and he got up in front of his church and demanded that they buy him a car. That didn't go over well. <laughs> his tenure in that church didn't last much longer after that. I want a car. You guys owe me a car. And I don't know the story. But it's the spirit of, I deserve it. Sometimes it's the you, the you owe me, I deserve it barrier is a bridge to immorality. What do I mean? It happens in marriages. We feel as though our spouse has incurred a debt to us. I treat them well, I provide for them, I do everything for them, whatever. I take care of the kids. I stay home. I'm faithful. I work hard all day, and I come home. Whoa, my iPad's falling over. <laughs> my Bible never did that, but my iPad does. <laughs> and then I hit the screen, and all the words go away. <laughs> Where was I? All right. And then, and then um, we all of a sudden build a case against our spouse because we're in a sense we're keeping score i do this and this and this and this and they should do their part and do this this or this and this you see and i'm winning right now five to one and so then i go into operation manipulation i get the icy cool maybe the icy cold i do a little emotional withdrawal maybe withholding affections, when the whole thing, it's this, I think I'm entitled to something. My marriage went from being unconditional to a bartering system. I will do this for you if you do this for me. I never voice it that way. I never identify it that way. But that's exactly what we've made it, a bartering system. And it is virtually impossible not the, all of us to cross that line. Except for my case, I never have. <laughs> I've been a perfect husband. I tell my wife all the time. 
as she rolls her eyes and walks away. <laughs> How about this one? You should not be rich. They won't say it, but I work harder than you. You should share your success with me, whatever. Sometimes it's a spirit of comparison. You're almost successful for me, but I'm better at this than you. I shouldn't, I work three times harder than this person works, and I'm three times less successful. Instead of rejoicing in their success, we get embittered. Instead of rejoicing that some has grace and blessings and material things, rejoicing for them, they won the lottery. No, I never won it. See, it's that same spirit. It's a very unobjective barrier. All they see is self. All they see is themselves. One of the biggest areas of this barrier, and this is a big one, saved it for last before we move on. Sometimes we want to blame God. We're going to blame somebody for this pain I'm going through. You're going to blame somebody for this loss I've had to endure. You're going to blame a person, a doctor, ourselves. Jesus, my friends, never guaranteed us that we would not lose. He never did. He never guaranteed us that we would not go without material blessing. He never guarantees us that we will not suffer. In fact, he guarantees us that we will. We cannot pick our Calvary. We cannot pick where we will die and where we will not die to ourselves. But God, I have served you my whole life. I've given you my all. I put my hand to the plow. I've been to the work of your ministry. And all I really want from you is a little this. All I needed you to do, God, is just preserve this for me, or bless me here, or take care of my future, or make sure I have a, a healthy retirement. Whatever it is, it could be anything. God, you owe me. At least that. Wouldn't you agree? See, God, I've served you all these years, again, with a bartering system. I'm going to serve you and give you my time, my effort, my resources, my gifts. I'm going to keep my hands at the plow, but do not touch my family. Do not touch my health. Do not touch me. We have our short list of things that are untouchables to God. We all do it. And I'm not saying that God's going to reach and touch those things. I think in rare cases he does. In my case, he did. And this is a wall I had to get over in my own life, a barrier I had to work down. Why not me? Why shouldn't I have to endure this? Why shouldn't I have not to suffered and lost? I'm no different than anyone else. We know the Christians all over the world suffer so grossly in comparison to us. Why not me? In a sense, I'm saying to God, I'm going to serve you, but don't make me hurt like this. Don't make me lose over here. And it becomes a barrier in our lives if we don't address it with God It will undermine our transformation and what God wants to do in our individual lives. It all started with a tree. And the first man and the first woman, they thought God owed them a special piece of fruit. Actually, it was more Eve's fault than Adam's. <laughs> Adam just did what he was told like a good husband. <laughs> Adam had the yes dear complex. Eve said, eat this. He goes, well, I'm not hungry. He goes, this is what you're getting. And so he ate it. And then sin came into the human race right after that. 
There was no menu. <laughs> they deserved to have what God had. Now, how does this, how do we cure this? I think there's two things, and these are just old Bible words. Humility and meekness. Humility towards men, where if this person down here or that person over here prospers and they have a wonderful family and they prosper, they prosper economically, they prosper well in the old age and they never get sick or something like that. You know my response to them? I'm so happy for them. I want the best for them. I want the best for me too, but it's not about me. I want the best for them. Because I take that person and I esteem them better than myself. I don't want them to suffer if I've had to suffer. I want them to go through anything that I might have had to go through. I want every one of you to win the lottery, then tithe. If you missed the addendum to that, I said then tithe. <laughs> Truly. And then meekness. Meekness is a powerful, strong biblical word, much different than in the Greek than it is in English. It means that I accept God's dealings with me as good. I'm willing to just accept what God does with me. And again, depending on what exactly I'm talking about there, that's going to be different for you and different for me. That may be a process that may take a few years to do that. But we give the liberty to God to be God. We don't give God our list of untouchables. He doesn't read it anyway. As long as we fist that white knuckle of that list, we'll never find freedom. Then you have the wall of victimhood. This is a new one. This is a great one. This is sort of the same thing. This is justifiable resentment. This will be really our last point, and we'll take it into some other sub-point of it. Here's a quote by Steve Ottenberg. He says, resentment is toxic. It can eat out your soul like an acid. Resentment also gives you control of your life, of your life, to a person you resent. Now, I can take that word resentment and probably put the word unforgiveness in there, and it would mean, at least in my mind, sort of the same thing. We don't realize that when we resent a person for what he has done to us, we do the very opposite of what we want. We allow that person to control us, and he becomes a wall that stops us cold, casting a dark shadow on the present and blocking off the future. Nobody would ever choose a slow, painful death. But resentment is a slow, painful death to the soul. I have met folks that have dealt with it, and I have met many who haven't years later. I've counseled couples that there was infidelity in a decade or two decades ago, and it's never truly been forgiven, and that infidelity is still polluting that relationship 20 and 30 years later. It doesn't come up in conversation every day, but it's kept somewhere in a file cabinet, and when the tension grows in the home, it's brought out of the file cabinet, and it becomes the thermonuclear blast of a marital argument. So it never really goes away. It's just saved for a rainy day when I need it. Does somebody ever hurt you? Not me. <laughs> Bucky Dent hurt me. He used to play for the Red Sox and not for the Yankees in 1978. He hit this stupid home run over the and that 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 wounded me deeply, Bucky Dent. But I've overcome that a year ago. <laughs> Anyone ever take advantage of you? Maybe you hired a Christian businessman. They always have scruples. <laughs> they never do. They, right? You hire somebody in a church or some Christian business. They have a fish anyway on their sign. And they end up doing a lousy job. And then you try to get justification. And they don't. Restitution, they won't give it to you. All of a sudden, they just disappear like the rapture. <laughs> They're Christians, by the way. 
Maybe somebody afflicted pain on you, misrepresented you, or maybe it's something a little bit more serious than that, much more serious than that. Maybe an adult imposed their will on you when you weren't old enough to defend yourself or speak up. And it mashes your soul up and it makes it so like a bowl of spaghetti. You can't untangle your emotions. That hinders you in your present life, hinders you in your marriage. That father, that mother, that relative. Maybe you've wondered this. I thought this person was a Christian. <laughs> Maybe you've said that. I have. Being truly victimized, truly victimized. I'm not talking about bearing the fruit of our own bad decisions. That's not being victimized. A lot of our pain is just self-afflicted. A lot of the things we do are just residual or cause and effect of decisions we make and relationships we build. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about an innocent person being victimized when they couldn't defend themselves or they couldn't stop it. And it causes this anger, which we'll talk about next week, and resentment in your soul. If you learn to live with it and not resolve it, it just keeps toxifying your body. It pollutes your, work, pollutes your heart, pollutes your mind like a cancer. It ebbs away your life on the inside hinders relationships on the current horizontal plane. You have to deal with it. And maybe today is a day that you can start really dealing with those deep things. Ephesians 4 verse 31 says, get, all, get rid of all bitterness. These are words we'll be looking at next week, some of them. Rage. That's the word, um, thumos, anger, that's orge, harsh words, slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, in other places, put on, two times in Ephesians and Colossians, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. So what's he saying here? He's saying, I take the bitterness, the rage, the anger, and all these things of who I am without Christ, and all of a sudden I push them through this filter. Who has a water filtration system at their house? I don't. I was just wondering. <laughs> what brand could you recommend? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm only kidding. <laughs> Actually, I don't have one, but I do have, I do have um, bought wa bottled water that says triple filtered. I don't know where you come from. If you're visiting with us, if you drank the water out of the tap here, you wouldn't. <laughs> you take about a sip and go, whoa. So this is triple filtered. In other words, it takes this water, pushes it through this thing, and it comes out pure. And all these chemicals, ammonia and arsenic and chlorine is out of the water, and it tastes better. And doesn't cause cancer as much. <laughs> That's what it's saying here. Get rid of, filter. Take, take the Word of God, Hebrews 4.12, the living Word of God. Filter through it your bitterness. Filter through it your rage. Filter through it your harsh words. Say, God, show me. Maybe you've never prayed this prayer, but maybe you have in some way. God, show me why this bothers me so much. Show me what plagued me here. Show me why this person irritates me and pushes my buttons. Show me why I even have a button. The question isn't who, isn't who pushes your buttons. The question is the button. The question, you have something that can be pushed. If all of a sudden I cock this little attitude, I don't like that person anymore, that person said this, eh, 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 eh. you have the issue, they don't have the issue, you have the issue. If somebody hurt you, my friends, emotionally or psychologically, in many cases, you let them. You take control of it. 
God has given you a living word. He has showed us how to think through what we call the Bible. I take that word and I filter it. My emotions may not catch up right away. Maybe for a while. And I may filter it and filter it and filter it and filter it. But someday you wake up and say, wow, I passed through it. That person doesn't control me anymore. Now, this is easier for guys sometimes than it is for ladies because we're just dumber. <laughs> we just go from box to box. Yeah, well, what am I thinking about today? Baseball. <laughs> That's what happens at my house anyway. So, Picrea, bitterness, it speaks of a bitter root left unintended. I forget who said this. Will poison the entire body. Many of you know where I live. I live on a busy street. lived there for over 30 years. And many of you know I got rid of my street address. I don't need it anymore. All I did is send a, a change into the, the post office and say, just send all my mail to the best lawn in St. Petersburg. <laughs> They'll know where to find me. If you ever want to know where I live, just Google Earth St. Petersburg, pick out the greenest piece of grass, and you'll see that's, that's where Pastor Kelly lives. That's, that's where he lives, the best lawn in St. Petersburg. I'm not boasting. I'm just telling the truth. <laughs> and, um, but it wasn't always like that. And I say that because I received so much mocking through the years and scarred my heart, scarred my soul. I, I'm, I, went, I had a nice lawn and it died. Bugs ate it and the people didn't treat it right. So I put a new lawn in and, then, and that one came in pretty nice. And a pool company came out. We put it above the ground liner. They decided to take my 30-foot my liner and loosen it up on my front lawn. They put it in the sun to get it pliable and it just burnt my lawn on all the roots of my lawn, so it looked like a whale died on my front lawn, and, and, um, and it was just dead. It was dead. And uh, so I ripped that lawn up, and I had a little invasion of Bermuda. This is Augustine. That's the best thing that grows down here. And these Bermuda shoots were making their way into my lawn. So I, I spent a month. I killed all the lawn, got rid of all the old sod. So all I had was dirt there. But I still had these little Bermuda shoots. And for a month, I went outside with my wheelbarrow for about an hour every night and just ripped up these little Bermuda shoots. Because these things, they were jumping from my neighbor's lawn, which was invasive. Their lawn wasn't nice. <laughs> just telling you, it's just in my heart here. And um, they're, they're nice people. I'm just kidding. And, um, but they were weeds. They mowed their weeds. I'm, never mind. That's all I'm going to say. I'm, just, I'm, I'm not going to go any further than that. And, and, um, and so, so they had, so they had I, I, for a month, I pulled up Bermuda shoots. They were everywhere. I think they were dead. But after a month, I couldn't find any more Bermuda shoots anywhere. Now, in that month, people are driving by my house, putting crosses in the middle of my lawn, my lawn sending me little notes, nice grass. <laughs> all these mocking things were going on all around me. It was says, I don't know. I'm looking at a couple families in my neighborhood that might have been doing that. I don't know. But they were putting little religious symbols there. Hey, this is a little, one said that there's a little cross sticking in the middle of my grass, middle of the night. I don't know when they did it, probably three in the morning. And a sign there, I did this because it looks more like a cemetery. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll show you. <laughs> Best lawn in St. Pete just won the award. I'm the only one who voted, but it just won the award. <laughs> so I, I say all that because if I didn't tear up all those Bermuda shoots, my perfect lawn would have Bermuda in it because there was a weed and it was invasive. I had to rip every one of them out. Five, six years later, I don't have any Bermuda in my sod. I'm telling you, if I left one shoot, it would have been invaded. Same way happens in our souls. If we don't root this stuff out, my friends, and really identify it for what it is, diagnose it and point it out and apply the Word of God to it, it's going to continually come back and run these little shoots up right into our hearts and souls. It doesn't say get rid of all bitterness except when somebody does something really bad to us. So let's just get rid of all bitterness. Resentment and bitterness is a, is a huge barrier that wants to suck the life out of us. Job 5.2 says, Surely resentment destroys the fool. 
And jealousy kills the simple. What happens when we get wounded like this? We want to get them back. We want revenge. I was telling somebody who lost a child recently, and I've said this to numerous folks. I said, anger is one of your safest emotions when you've had a great loss. It's easy to be angry. It's easier, um, it's harder to accept it. As long as I can point at something, somebody, some incident, and be angry about it, it protects me, like I said earlier, barriers are put to protect us. But I'll never resolve it until I resolve the anger. Otterburn tells the story of a lady abandoned by her father. And the husband of many years ran off with another woman. She at first waited for her, um, his new marriage to end. He remarried somebody, his new marriage to end, so he would come crawling back to her, and he, she waited about a decade. And she concluded, if he would just apologize, she went from like, I want him to come crawling back to me, to okay, now, at, at, 10 years later, now all he has to do is apologize. She can move on. 10 more years pass. And she seeks counseling and says, how do I make him say I'm sorry? 20 years of her life, she waited for somebody to fix something with her when it was never going to happen. She lost 20 years of peace, 20 years of inner contentment or prospering because somebody victimized her, wrongly so, and he never fixed, fixed it. Forgiveness is a decision that kicks off a process. Dealing with this resentments that we have, and we all have them. So we make that decision, the sooner the better, and we begin living again. Now understanding this, and this is my last part of the message, um, this is what forgiveness is not. I think I have it on the screen for you back there. Yeah, okay. Number one, it's approving of what the person did. It's not approving um, what the person did. In other words, I, I'm not saying what they did was okay. It was wrong. It's not excusing what the person did. It's not saying, well, I know that person had a lot of issues and this and that, so they did that for that reason. I understand, and that may be a case like that, but it may not be a case like that. It's not justifying what the person did. It's not pardoning, really, what the person did. I'll be balancing these soon. Forgiveness may or may not require reconciliation. This dear woman we talked about never reconciled with her husband, to my knowledge. So there may be reconciliation involved, but oftentimes there's not reconciliation involved because it's not really about the person who hurt you. It's about you and what's going on inside of you. God will worry about the person who hurt you. He has ways of taking care of those things. But I resolve what happened to me in my own heart. It is not denying what the person did, and it's not pretending that we were not hurt. Because the pain is real. Whatever that is. And it's going to be different for your situation and different for mine. What is total forgiveness? being a legitimate victim and forgiving anyway. We eliminate the record of the offense, especially in marriage. In other words, I don't save those thermonuclear memories for those precious times when there's tension between me and my spouse. I don't take my spouse and filter them through pain that other people have caused in my life. I don't take my spouse and apply them to other relationships we may have that may have hurt me. No, when I 
forgive, I bury it. And when it digs its way out of the grave, I put it right back in the grave and we filter it through the Word of God. We stop waiting for those who victimize us to be punished. People have hurt me, and I've been, I'm, I happen to be a very spiritual man. <laughs> and, and, um, and I would watch them be blessed, and I'd be, oh, oh God, how come, how come they're blessed? Then, and here's another one that bugged me, is um, I would watch people like them. How can, you, how can they like that person? Don't they know what he did to me? They can't like them. They can't be friends with them. What's wrong with them? Don't they have any discernment? <laughs> This person hurt me. And I want other people to fight my battles. I want other people to be on my side. I don't ever say it like that, but that's what's really going on in my brain. So we stop waiting for them to be punished. We don't tell others gossip of the infraction. I'm a spiritual guy. But I'll go to Andre... Andre, you know, I'm not going to tell everybody, but I'll tell Andre, and you know, they did this, and maybe another good friend over here, and maybe another good friend over here. So all of a sudden, you know what I can do is I can take Andre's heart and maybe turn it a little bit against that person who hurt me, even though he may just be getting a real small part of the story or half the story or may not know the whole story. He's just getting my view of it. Andre loves me, he'll hear me, and all of a sudden he'll start thinking a little bit about Mona over here. Because I, I didn't really, I haven't talked behind your back. You were right in front of me when I talked about you. <laughs> and, um, and, um, and, um, but I'll turn his heart a little bit towards Mona, just a little bit. Makes me feel good that he now suspects her. Also, that can almost be called evil. We give grace and mercy. Both those words mean they don't deserve it. We just give it. We relinquish, like we said, and we take the bitterness and the resentment and we push it through the filter of the Word of God. We understand that we may never hear I'm sorry from them. And sometimes, my friends, we have to forgive God. I know I've had to. That allows these things to have happened. And this is the last one and a big one. We forgive them unto God, not unto them. They didn't earn the forgiveness, even though they even could have. They may have asked for it. I, I don't forgive them because they've earned it. I don't forgive them because they've asked for forgiveness. I don't forgive them because they've cleaned up their act. I don't forgive them. For, I forgive them unto God. God, I forgive them unto you. In fact, you find that if you take your whole life and you filter it through the unto God principle, everything fixes itself. I do ministry unto God, not a local church. I do, I love my wife unto God, not because she loves me back. I lay down my life for people who use me uh, unto God, not because I'm expecting to get honor, praise, or people to love me back. I do it unto God. I give of my resources unto God, not because I, I want anything to do with anyone else. This is unto God. So when I do these things under God, it takes all the human element right out of it. Now it makes my life really simple. I can just love you unconditionally and purely because I don't need anything from you. I don't expect anything from you. I may get affirmation. I may get love. I may get approval, but it doesn't matter whether I get it or not. I'm living my life under God. I'm going to love you whether you love me or not. I'm going to affirm you whether you affirm me back or not. I'm going to approve you whether you approve of me or not. I'm going to forgive you whether you even want to be forgiven. Unto God. Because when I die and I stand there, that's who I'll be standing before. Him. And as we sang, 
I'm going to see sin. I'm going to see grace. I'm going to see mercy. I'm going to see forgiveness. I'm going to see the righteousness of God, the holiness of God. And I'm going to see how guilty I really was. All in a millisecond after death. So what we do here, we do it unto Him. Not unto each other. Each other will be the recipients of what we do unto Him. But when we do it unto Him, the energy is endless. The Spirit enables us. Because I'm doing it for the one who loves me most. If I'm doing it horizontally, my friend, I'm going to be let down. I'm going to be hurt. I'm going to get frustrated. I'm going to be wounded. I'm going to draw my battle lines. But when I do it unto Him, it's effortless. Because for all eternity, as we sang just a few minutes ago, we'll be giving Him all praise, honor, and glory and exalting Him forever. Amen. Jesus, thank you for these words and thank you for the precious people here. With every head bowed and every eye closed as we do every service here at Grace Connection. We don't want to single anyone out. We don't want to embarrass anyone in any way. We never try to. But if you're here today and you don't know if you have a relationship with God or not, Jesus Christ said a verse many of us know for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, whosoever believes in him should never perish but have everlasting life. Whosoever, that means you, that means me, that means the whole world, the four corners of the earth, every human being. Whosoever believes on him should never perish. Didn't say believe and change. Didn't say believe and do this. It didn't say believe and do anything. It just said whosoever believes that Jesus is who he says he was, the Son of God, co-equal with the Father. And he died on the cross to pay for our sins, and he did what he said he would do. Should never perish, but have everlasting life. You may have a lot of questions about a lot of things, but let's keep it simple. Salvation's free. We just accept it like we accept any gift. If you're here today and never asked Jesus to be your Savior, between you and God, it's a personal, private decision. Say, dear Jesus, in your own way, your own words, thank you for loving me. Thank you for caring for me. Today I ask you to be my Savior. I want to be part of your family. I want to be one of your children, as you promised. I want my name to be written among the ledgers of your people. I want to know that the moment I die, I'll be in your presence. With every head bowed, if you said that prayer in your heart of hearts, your mind of minds, just let somebody know. Let the person who brought you know. Let the person sit next to you, maybe Pastor Goldworthy, myself, on the way out the door. We just want to pray with you. Maybe give you some parting instructions. Father, um, these barriers we talked about today, they, um, some of them, we don't even know we have them. God, I'm pretty sure I have some resentments I'm not aware that I even have. I'm sure that I have some roots of bitterness that I'm still trying to uncover, like those from that Bermuda weed in my lawn. God, this is an imperfect science for me. I know it's an imperfect science for all of us. But I know your desire is to conform us into your image. So to the best of my ability, Father, and please instruct me through your Holy Spirit and, and through your word when I fail at this. Show me where I'm living my life somewhere else than simply unto you. I want to live my life unto you in my marriage, in my money, in my ministry, in my commerce, in my private life, my quiet times when no one's around. 
is unto you. Because you truly are the only one that will receive all praise, honor, and glory for all eternity. Bless our offering we're about to share as part of our worship. And Father, we love you. Thank you for blessing us like you have. In Jesus' name.